back uh, for some of you. For some of you who have been at uh, previous two subcommittee meetings, welcome back. Um, so we definitely ha had a full week and it was, uh, it was really great getting started. Um, we have our policy and practice subcommittee, first uh, policy and practice subcommittee meeting for the GAP Fact today. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen here in a bit and want to share a couple of things about what we're doing today. First of all, um, I'll bring Stephanie, if you wanna introduce yourself, help say hello, Stephanie, for a bit. Hello, I'm Stephanie Hardison, um, the uh, deputy designated federal officer. Great. And we expect a couple of members of the public to join in for just a reminder for our subcommittee meetings. We do not expect a large group as we've had in our full committee meetings, but just for, for the benefit of, of our public uh, participants today, this is a federal advisory committee under the, the FACA uh, rules. And so we basically have a, a group here, of very talented individuals that have come together to take a look at our processes here in the GSA in terms of acquisition. Uh, this is a process that we do in transparency. We have a, an active website, so you can see everything that we're doing. Uh, again, this follows a longstanding tradition. As you can see, the Committee uh, Act has been around for quite a while. So um, a little background on the uh, GAP FAC. Uh, we actually got started in July of this year, and we have uh, a very, I would say, laser focus here on policy processes, regulatory activities we can take to embed climate and sustainability in the federal acquisition process. Uh, it started with the GSA lens uh, with a really an outstanding mix of um, uh, perspectives represented here, as well as uh, experts who are uh, just joining in for the first time to our activities. Um, hey, hey, Boris, you're coming in and out on me. Does anybody else have a Boris? Yeah, yeah, it's the same for me as well. Yes, yeah, he's getting in and out. Sorry, Boris. You want to drive the slides? Yeah, yeah. can you hear me now? Yes. Oops. Can you hear me now? Did I? Yes. I, just... I can hear you now. Can you? Okay. Am I back on? Yep. Good, good. Uh, so what I'm going to do right now is just to, uh, to see who's here so far. We may have some others uh, come in later as we get started, but I just wanted to do a quick roll call just to see who's been able to uh, get on the call. So I'm going to start first with our chair, uh, Steve Schooner, and just stay present if you will, please. Present. All right. Uh, look, basis. Present. All right. Uh, Richard Vitell. Present. All right. Leslie Cortez. Present. Okay. Antonio Das. Present. Uh, Mark Hayden. Present. All right. Mamie Mallory. Present. Okay. Amlin McCurgy. Present. Jenny Romer. Present. Stacy Smedley. Present. Okay, Nigel Stevens. Present. Anish Dilak. Present. Uh, David Wagger. Present. And Kimberly Wise. Present. All right, outstanding. So we have a full, full set here today. I wanted to briefly go over, and some of you have seen this from our previous two meetings. Um, it, a reminder that this is a subcommittee meeting for the policy and practices presentation really intended for the subcommittee. If you're a member of the public or if you're not on the subcommittee, um, just being respectful of those discuss some space towards the end of the meeting for, and, and we say two minutes, but it will really be up to the chairs how much time they, they would like to give you to make any comments for the committee, for the subcommittee to hear. Um, we do have other opportunities for you to comment through our web 
site uh, through the Federal Register notice, and we have set up through regulations.gov a docket where we will expect, and we will definitely see a lot of activity there once we start developing products as a subcommittee and then a committee, of course. So uh, we, and here is the uh, the information. So we, I wanted to just stop there right now, and without further ado, just bring back. Let me get my. Yeah, I turned off my camera so that I'm not using as much bandwidth. But uh, I would like to introduce uh, Steve Schooner and Luke Basis, who will take us from here on the uh, proceedings. Steve and Luke, you got it. So, so first, uh, thank you, Boris. Thank you, Stephanie. And thanks to the GSA team that supports us. Thanks to everyone who is participating in this subcommittee. Uh, when Luke and I were speaking in advance, um, we thought that maybe one thing that would be really valuable is for us to, in a moment, just go around and reintroduce ourselves. I realize we all introduced ourselves as a plenary committee the first time, but that was a lot of people. And uh, I didn't get them all the first time, so I'd love to hear from everybody again. We'll do that in just a moment. But I, I want to be really, really clear how much I appreciate Luke's efforts so far and what we expect of him in the future. And um, as I start the introductions, actually, and Boris, if you could, could you pop that slide up there, up there, so that we have the list again as we march through? And then we can all just say a word about ourselves and go through real quick. But I'll, I'll start again. Uh, for those of you who I haven't crossed paths with before, uh, Professor Steve Schooner, I'm at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. We teach and award a number of graduate degrees in government contract related topics. Um, in a former life, the last job I had before I came here is I was at the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, and I expect we'll hear a fair amount about and from OFPP in our efforts here. And I worked with Jeff's predecessor, Jeffrey Kozis's predecessor there. Uh, I'm going to lay my cards on the table because the only reason I'm putting time into the committee and the subcommittee is I believe there is nothing more important for us to focus on than climate change. In my experience, talking to government officials, talking to the public, talking to my students, uh, one of the first things that people tend to not appreciate is a difference between climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, one thing that our governments are doing now, today, is they are adapting to climate change. It's getting hotter. There are more storms. There are more floods. The Navy is worried about raising their ports. The Air Force is worried about melting runways. But adaptation are the things that we have to do because climate change is now a fact. And everything about climate change is baked in. We need to keep reminding ourselves that this isn't one of those stories where we're going to behave a little bit better and things are going to get better. That's a new baseline. So the other challenge that we have, and one of the things we're asked to be thinking about, is how we're going to mitigate climate change. What the government can do to move markets and change behavior so that we can slow down the rate of climate change. Now, as you can see from the gray hair, like a lot of you, I've been around this game for a long time. We've gone through a number of major trends that have reinvented the profession, both on the buy and the sell side as we know it. Maybe the most dramatic was the confluence of the internet, electronic commerce, and all of these powerful tools that change the way we do business. But for the next generation, for the ones younger than us, my students, your kids, if we can't convince the next generation of buyers and sellers to fundamentally change their behavior, I believe we fail. So we're gonna be talking about macro, big, big issues, systemic changes, and we'll be talking about a lot of smaller things that'll be easier. And I think today's a good example of a micro achievable policy that incrementally moves us in the direction. But I'm here hunting big game. Uh, I wanna change the world. I wanna break the mold. And again, in terms of potential tension, if, if you believe that the main thing that we should do is make this comfortable for the government as buyers and the private sector as sellers, we're already at a tension point. But I hope you'll join me in trying to, again, do dramatic things so that our children and their children's children have some of the opportunities we had in life. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Luke. 
Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I follow that up other than to stand up and give a standing ovation. Uh, that was fantastic, well said. I echo it all, uh, and, and I'm not quite sure what to add. Uh, other than to say it's, a, it's an honor to be here uh, and serve as co-chair and be a sidekick to the brilliant Professor Schooner. Uh, upon my appointment to this committee, I undertook extensive research trying to get as smart on the relevant topics as possible. Uh, and time and time again, Professor Schooner's uh, articles and white papers were rising to the top of my Google searches. So it really is an amazing thing to be able to share some of this responsibility with someone who really is a, a subject matter expert on his own in the relevant fields. As for myself, I look forward to working with this group and getting started, uh, rolling our sleeves up uh, and trying to solve some of the existential challenges that are before us. I agree with Steve, climate change is the challenge for our generation. Uh, this group has some extraordinary potential uh, and the potential to do something about it. Uh, amongst the 14 of us, there are eight professionals who are primarily in sustainability field, 11 people with uh, current or past experience working for government entities, many of whom have served in executive leadership, eight representatives from the private sector, three people who can proudly refer to themselves as doctor, three who work in academia, at least two professors, uh, and four attorneys from a wide range of fields. I'd need another two weeks to compile a list of uh, publications, awards, and advanced degrees amongst this group. Uh, it's an incredible group, and we want to hear from you. We encourage you all to speak. And so along those lines, as the professor said, we would like to hear uh, from of you, from each one of you, and maybe we'll go in the order of the names on the screen right now. Maybe just tell us who you are and, and tell the group. Uh, I think somebody's somebody should put themselves on mute. But if you can tell us who you are, uh, let us know, you know, why you're you were interested in participating in the FACA, and either what you hope to achieve or what you would consider a successful a successful outcome for this subcommittee. Uh, why don't we start with Richard? Well, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rich Butel. I'm a recovering government contracts lawyer by trade. Uh, and uh, uh, currently a principal researcher at the George Mason Baroni Center uh, for Government Contracting, formerly also an adjunct for, uh, uh, faculty at Georgetown University in the Law Center. Prior to that time, 10 years on the Hill, both in the House and the Senate, uh, working on legislative policy uh, and on IT policy. My subspecialty is in IT uh, and um, uh, technology procurement and the use of technology to modernize government to create a modern 21st century uh, government digital um, uh, framework to serve the American people. So um, that's my background. Uh, my interest in this process is to look at, at acquisition from a what we call the big A perspective. It's a system that needs to have transparent, responsive, um, and, and focused um, uh, attributes uh, that better serve all the constituencies and stakeholders uh, across, across the, act, the, the federal procurement space. And so my focus will be on, on working policies and procedures that, that support this important goal and objective while at the same time acknowledging the equities of other major stakeholders such as small business, um, um, and uh, um, other major uh, executive order um, goals and objectives from the Biden administration. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Richard. Leslie Cordes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again for hosting and for everyone's efforts to put together such a, a well-run committee structure. I've been really impressed by how organized the process has been and everyone's participation. So thank you for allowing me to join you. Um, I've worked with some of you over the years. I've been in the climate and clean energy space for about 35 years. I started my career on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, uh, was there for nine years, worked on a number of um, energy initiatives, including the Federal Energy Management Program, went on to work for USAID and US EPA, where I was um, head of the clean energy branch and as such worked on a lot of Energy Star programs and, and with 
um, a lot of corporate um, leadership on the climate space. I'm now with a small NGO called Ceres. We're based in Boston. We have about 200 staff working across a range of efforts to mobilize capital markets around clean energies. So I'm vice president of programs. I manage our water, our food and forest, and our climate and energy programs. And we do a lot of work at the state and federal level. We work with investor and corporate voices to help them realize greater ambition on climate and uh, water quality, deforestation efforts, et cetera. So I'm hoping to put my expertise and, and that of the organization to any um, productive service I can for this for the goals of this committee. So thanks again and look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. That's a terrific wealth of experience you bring to the table. Uh, Antonio Das. All right. Good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, Antonio Das, I'm the uh, serving in the role as the Deputy Associate Administrator at the U.S. Small Business Administration. I have about a two-decade uh, tenure here at the Small Business Administration, where I've worked in a number of different capacities, uh, including uh, serving as a district director, uh, overseeing our Small Business Development Center programs, and a couple other different posts over those years. So our, my interest really is about small business. You know, how do we make sure that as we craft solutions and we look at the future for uh, our government contract, our government contracting policies as they relate also to this field, that we make sure small businesses are an active participant and that they're part of the solution uh, for a long-term basis. Recognize that small businesses bring with them uh, a capacity for innovation that if, uh, if not present, uh, will limit the success that we can uh, expect to have. And to be able to make sure that not only are we helping the small businesses participate from a, a supplier perspective, but we're giving them an opportunity to be uh, key uh, uh, employers of people who are also looking in this field uh, so that it's a holistic uh, exchange. And uh, we anticipate more and more that we're going to be pushing for small businesses to have you know, greater participation in our federal space. We've had a lot of really great success these last few years. And policies are very important to how all these things come together. And so here is an advocate for small business uh, to make sure that to the extent that small businesses can be appropriately represented uh, in the thinking and the planning and the design and uh, the, you know, the ultimate blueprint of what we put together here, that, that they have that opportunity uh, to be recognized. So thanks, glad to be a part of it. Thank you, look forward to working with you. Uh, Thank you. Mark, Mark Hayden. Thank you, Luke. Uh, I am Mark Hayden and, and like Luke, uh, I, I am a big fan of Steven Schooner and I wanna be more like him. Uh, I was general, I'm currently general counsel for the state of New Mexico Office of Superintendent of Insurance. I am the uh, prior director of New Mexico State Purchasing. Yeah, 25 years as a litigator in Chicago, and I was a COP26 attendee last year in Glasgow. I'm teaching a course currently at the uh, for, for sustainability at the New Mexico State University next year for over 600 certified chief procurement officers throughout the state so they can learn, be part of a green team, and think about sustainability in their daily purchases. Uh, throughout, uh, at General Services, for eight years, we electrified the state with the EV, EV uh, cars, charging stations, solar, and wind. And we're now looking at becoming a hydrogen hub for the Southwest. Uh, what do I'd like to achieve? Um, I'd like to bring the expertise from this fine panel uh, to the state level. And uh, a win to me looks like implementing these concepts uh, by becoming a lead state on sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds like there's probably things the federal uh, level can learn from what you're doing in New Mexico, too. That's that's fascinating. Uh, Mamie Mallory. Um, good afternoon. Um... Again, Mamie, uh, I am president and CEO of Mallory and Associates, LLC, uh, formerly retired executive from the Federal Aviation Administration after 36 years. 
Uh, I started my career with the Department of the Navy as an engineer, uh, program manager for hazardous material, hazardous waste. Um, transitioned to the FAA, uh, also dealt with design and construction activities, director of uh, aviation logistics, and um, that's pretty much my background. Uh, retired as the assistant admi administrator for civil rights. So I was over the disadvantaged business enterprise and the airport concession disadvantaged business enterprise. And uh, the accessibility of, uh, of our nation's airports for, uh, for persons with disabilities and also serving li limited English proficiency community as well. Um, what I hope to um, get from uh, the participation in this, uh, the inclusion or consideration of the small businesses and the implication of the sustainability po policy as it pertains to that group. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, an amazing career. Uh, Dr. Amlan Mukherjee. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Amlan Mukherjee, a professor in civil environmental engineering at Michigan Tech. Uh, my background has been in life cycle assessment of construction materials. My background is in construction, highway construction. And uh, I've, in the last 12, 15 years, been part of the sustainable pavements uh, technical working group through the Federal Highway Administration, uh, as well as I've helped the asphalt industry uh, facilitate uh, the setting up of their environmental product declaration program. Uh, and also worked with the federal life cycle assessment at the federal LCA Commons in developing uh, background data sets and other standardized uh, methods for developing uh, construction material life cycle assessment and and harmonized environmental product declarations. Um, in the last two years, I've been uh, on um, um, IPA with uh, the Federal Highway Administration and the Office of uh, Pavement Design. Uh, and uh, construction, BIM design construction performance in the Office of Infrastructure. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have to say I strongly um, support everything that Dr. Schooner said. Sorry, I'm messing up your name there. Uh, right at the beginning of the, the meeting, uh, this is the most important problem we have. Climate challenge is the most important problem we have right now to address. And while uh, we do want to take major radical steps when it comes to how we are purchasing our materials and how that affects our green procurement. We have to do so in uh, in a way that can really take us forward in terms of our design construction, as well as our long-term performance of our assets. Uh, so keeping in mind, keeping an eye on the embodied carbon, as well as the long-term operational aspects of our, uh, our choices. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Romer. Hi everyone, Jenny Romer, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Pollution Prevention at EPA. So I oversee EPA's pollution prevention programs. So that's Environmentally Preferable Purchasing or EPP, our Safer Choice Program, Green Chemistry Awards, and our RP2 grants. Uh, so with the EPP program, I'm very involved with, with, the, with federal purchasing. I oversee um, the IRA funding for um, for low and body carbon and construction materials. So everything I was hearing there was recognizing a lot of that. Um, and I'm really spending a lot of my time figuring out how we can use our EPP program um, to really solve some of the um, issues with, with federal procurement, with um, buying green and how to, um, make small changes, uh, but I really see this group as an opportunity to look, to zoom out and look at the bigger picture and what, what can be done and really uh, hear from all of you um, what those ideas are. And I think bring some of my knowledge of, of what, what issues we've run into um, and really hope to have some great conversations and be able to, like I said, uh, look at this from a from a different perspective rather than the one that I'm looking at every day. And really happy to be here. Completely agree about climate. And um, happy to the, we have a six hundred and fifty billion dollar annual spend in the U.S. government. And so really being able to harness that um, is what I what I'm really excited about. And I have a background 
I'm a, an attorney and I have a background in um, plastic pollution reduction policies before coming to EPA. So good to meet you all again. Thank you. Really looking forward to your contributions. Uh, Stacy Smedley. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, I'm very, as many have said, I'm very uh, excited to be a part of this group and feel fortunate uh, to be able to contribute, but also learn uh, through this process as we try to tackle this um, this big issue of climate change that we all are passionate about. So I'm currently the executive director of Building Transparency, which is a nonprofit organization uh, with a mission of providing the free open access data and tools necessary to reduce embodied carbon emissions, which are really supply chain emissions of construction materials. Uh, my background before that was uh, as a procurer, uh, as a general contractor at Skanska, a USA building, where I was a senior sustainability director, uh, really focused on uh, how we could, through the lens of construction procurement, uh, get to decarbonizing the materials that we were using based on Skanska as a private company setting zero carbon targets that included those supply chain emissions of what we, what we were buying. Um, I was the co-conceiver of the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator tool, which is the tool that Building Transparency now maintains that focuses on providing open, transparent, digital environmental product declaration data for construction products. Um, and we are now working with a lot of the large private sector companies uh, like Microsoft and Amazon, and many others, um, as they implement similar policies around procurement uh, and trying to do that in a way that can be credible, vetted, and reportable to try to reduce emissions. So I'm hoping to be um, a conduit between the private and the public sector as we all try to tackle this problem so that the solutions that we land on and the policies that we put in place are transferable and translatable and can give those manufacturers and those that have to actually implement, report, and reduce carbon emissions of their products um, one very aligned um, uh, requirement and approach. Um, so that's my big focus is just the data transparency part of this, uh, how we uh, inform policies. We're on the current uh, United Nations Industrial Deep Decarbonization Initiative working groups trying to help the UN get countries to pledge into this. We've helped inform some of the IRA funding on the program you just heard about when it comes to low carbon procurement and EBD grants. And again, just how we can be connective tissue to ensure that we all approach this in an aligned, harmonized way uh, to make action happen as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Nigel Stevens. Thank you. And, and following Stacy as somebody who is uh, loving data, performance metrics, and reporting, uh, that was just music to my ears, Stacy. So thank you for that. Look forward to learning more from you. Uh, Nigel Stevens, uh, my background is um, in technology, uh, federal procurement and uh, small business uh, policy and legislative issues. Uh, worked on the Senate Small Business Committee and for two members of Congress that were on the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, my goal here uh, with working with this team is to really uh, work to collect and develop some recommendations to drive policy and legislation in two key areas. Um, ensuring that the communities that are affected uh, most disproportionately by climate change and, and pollution are considered and are a focal point um, as recipients of the outcomes that we are going to be provided, that we are going to be recommending, and also making sure that those businesses play a role, not only in the mitigation, thank you, Steve, I, I, I thoroughly support the mitigation aspect, not just living with it, um, of climate change, but also the long-term industries that are going to be created as a result of that. Uh, it took us many uh, decades and billions of dollars to get us into this position. It's going to take many decades and billions of dollars to get us out. And I want to make sure that those small minority women-owned businesses also play a vital role in those economies of the future. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, Anish Tilak. Hi, everyone. I'm so honored to be here. I'm Anish Tilak. I'm a manager in the Carbon-Free Buildings Program at RMI. I work in our Embodied Carbon Initiative, which uh, looks at all things decarbonizing building and construction materials. Um, I've been working um, pretty intensively in the last few years on buy clean policies, which you may have heard of. It's a green public procurement policy for uh, construction materials and beyond. Uh, my background is in the building industry. I'm a licensed architect. Um, I worked for many years as a sustainability consultant in the building sector. So. Um, I worked with developers, public institutions um, on building scale projects and also campus master planning projects. So some experience I, that I can contribute is really looking at 
developing sustainability guidelines for campuses and master plans and seeing them through uh, the development and construction process. And so kind of that on the ground experience, um, being on the engineering and construction side of the table when it comes to contracts. Um, so yeah, developed RFPs and sustainability procurement guidelines and also followed them. Um, have worked, um, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area and I've worked with the University of California system, which I think has a really a robust and strong sustainability policy when it comes to procurement. So have some experience um, uh, with that um, document as well. Uh, so yeah, looking looking forward to contribute where I can and uh, yeah, just making sure that we can have a, a fair, equitable and competitive procurement policy that, that moves us towards a carbon neutral future. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. David Wagger. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to see everybody. I'm honored to be part of the GAP FAC as well as the subcommittee. Uh, I, I am chief scientist and director of environmental management at the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, which is a, a trade association based in Washington, D.C. that rep represents the recycled materials industry. I think the simplest way to understand my involvement or my interest is that as the, the largest buyer in the U.S., the, the U.S. government can encourage manufacturers to make products that are designed to be recycled and also use recycled content, which are two key issues for our industry. Um, you know, those types of incentives to manufacturers can help bootstrap a lot of the sustainable materials manufacturing capabilities in the United States. You know, connected with this, I also served previously as a tech on the Technical Advisory Committee and now the Strategic Advisory Committee of Remade Institute, which is all about sustainable materials manufacturing, looking at design for recycling or reuse or remanufacturing, remanufacturing, recycling, recovery, all the things that make materials more sustainable. I'm also um, uh, co-chair of Project Group One of the Basel, Plast Basel Convention Plastic Waste Partnership, looking at better ways to uh, recycle or reuse plastics. So hopefully my expertise in those areas, design and also uh, sustainability will be helpful to the policy and practice uh, decision-making of this subcommittee and GAPFAC in general. Um, so I look forward to working with you all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Wisewhite. Hello everyone. And like everyone has said before, I am really excited to be participating on the subcommittee and on the committee overall. Um, I am the Vice President of Regulatory and Scientific Affairs for the American Chemistry Council. We are a trade association that represents most of the leading companies engaged in the business of chemistry. Not surprising, chemistry is critical to the development and deployment of all of the leading technologies uh, to uh, address climate change. And so my interest here is to really make sure, and I'm a toxicologist by background, and so I'm really focused in on making sure that we have strong science and fact-based in the development of the policies, that they can actually be sustainable and uh, have longevity over time. And so we want to build a program that is really going to allow the federal agencies and the federal procurement process really grow and improve and be sustainable, not only from a chemistry perspective, but also from an overall consideration of life cycle analysis. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, that was uh, extremely informative and exciting. I, I'm really excited to work with you guys. The, you know, I did not hear any one word answers. The, the passion in the room is there. Uh, you guys bring a wealth of experience and, you know, uh, me and Steve both have a high level of confidence that this group is going to be able to get something done. Um, I guess, Steve, do you want to have any final words before uh, the guest speaker? No, I'm just ecstatic to hear the level of engagement and the level of expertise and the breadth of the diversity. Um, but yeah, I think what we 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 should uh, be somewhat thankful that our guest speaker has been extremely patient while we did that. I think it was well worth our time. But uh, I think, believe Boris is going to introduce our guest speaker now. So. Yeah, thank you, Steve, and Luke, and all of you for, uh, again, sharing. And I, I do want to um, welcome our speaker this afternoon. Um, so it's my colleague from GSA, Adina Tolbert's son. I, I usually call you Adina, so please correct me in the last time, <laughs> if need be. But Adina has been doing a lot of work in sustainable acquisition. We have a working group within GSA where different parts of the agency come together 
uh, to talk about what's going on because GSA is actually a fairly complex and large organization that has a lot of different aspects of uh, what we do. And Adina has always brought just this uh, kind of sanity check and you know, all the things that we're talking about. And, and it just she really has a, a very exciting project I think will fit in with a lot of what, what I heard in these introductions. Uh, so without taking any more time from Adina, I'm going to turn it over to you, Adina, and take, take it from here. Okay. Um, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, Boris, if it's okay, I'm going to share my slides because sometimes in Zoom, when I'm in a slide, it will just mute me and I can't unmute. So I'm just going to see if you can still hear me when I pull up the slides. So just give sure. me a second. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be glad to share them for you if you think that would be easier. Oh, there you go. You got it. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me still? Mm-hmm. And, and okay, I'm, perfect. Can, can we get you into, into present mode? Mm-hmm. All right. Outstanding. Thank you. Okay. And everyone can still hear me? Yep. Can you're you good hear me? to go. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can okay. hear you. Okay, all right. Sorry, I have some, some Zoom anxiety. Okay. <laughs> um, so as, as Boris mentioned, one of the things that uh, GSA is seeking to pursue is addressing single-use plastics. Um, and as he, as, as Boris mentioned, so we're both within GSA in the Office of Government-Wide Policy. Um, I'm specifically responsible for uh, acquisition related policy with a focus on sustainability. Um, and so, so this is within, I guess, my, uh, my, my area of expertise in terms of how does, how do we address this through, uh, federal acquisition? Um, so I just wanted to fill everyone in on some of the, the, um, steps that we've taken to date. Uh, so we're looking to, um, seek advice and understanding from your, your subcommittee, um, in terms of what GSA should pursue um, to understand really the pros and cons to if we, we address single-use plastics through rulemaking process, um, and then any type of potential uh, unintended consequences. Uh, we're considering plastics for a number of reasons. So I, I guess just as background, um, within GSA acquisition policy, we have, I guess, two, uh, you know, two guide, uh, policy guidances that we look at. One is if it's regulatory, which is the GSA acquisition regulation, so GSAR, and the other is if it's, a, if it's our policy manual, which is um, the GSAM. Uh, last year, we updated the GSAM to address in our requirements planning a bit about waste uh, management and uh, packaging was, was addressed. Um, Basically, we at that time we we made the change to our acquisition policy manual, and right afterwards we received a petition from the Center for Biodiversity. Um, so the change was made in October of 2021. We received the petition in December of 2021. Uh, the petition's requests kind of aligned with where we had already gone with that initial step in October. Um, so. It, and it identified basically numer uh, numerous risks associated with plastics and, and how it relates to the products that we procure. Um, so basically we, we received the petition, then we decided to research, determine how we would respond to the petition. Um, we did reach out to the, to the EPA as well uh, to get their take on it. Um, and our end result was we granted the petition in part and denied it in part. Um, and and the, the rationale being is that we would take action, but maybe not necessarily the action that the Center for Biodiversity was seeking. Um, one of the elements that we're really considering within this space is uh, single-use plastic packaging. Um, the reason for considering packaging versus other types of, of single-use plastics, such as say, um, you know, straws or utensils or things of that nature, is 40% uh, of the single of the plastic market is single-use plastics or is sorry is packaging. Um, 
We also, uh, in our research, found uh, EPA cited that in 2018, single-use plastic containers alone accounted for 14.5 million tons of plastic. Um, in terms of when we think about what is, in fact, single-use, uh, plastic packaging is, I would say, understood to be a single-use product in that once you receive it, you, you throw it out immediately. Um, there's not any type of opportunity to reuse that, that uh, you know, plastic, say it's like a plastic wrapper or something that's on something that you've had shipped. Uh, there's not really an opportunity to reuse it once it's been opened. Um, there's also a, a cost associated with the waste disposal that is economic, social, and environmental. Uh, so when we think about, there's a few things with plastics. Um, on the one hand, plastic in and of itself, and um, I know our office, re we released uh, an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking to address single-use plastics. S some of the responses that were received, it seemed that uh, basically some industries viewed it as, is GSA looking to ban plastic? And the answer is no. Uh, plastics are, you know, have done great things. They've definitely changed um, healthcare. Uh, there's plastic uh, on the International Space Station. Um, there's there's definitely a use for the material because it is very durable, um, and you know has definitely furthered. Uh, we wouldn't be able to be where we're at currently in our world without plastic. Um, but we really want to focus on the plastic that is just essentially becoming waste that is polluting. Um, and that is really having an economic and social toll. I, I know that during the introduction, some of you addressed the you know, environmental justice concerns and, and things of that nature. Um, and, and this is definitely a topic within sustainability that we could address all of those things. Uh, there's also the economic piece of it where if we buy um, something, if we buy a widget and the widget is made of plastic itself, which is the plastic we want, but say it's triple wrapped in, you know, bubble wrap or some type of saran wrap or, or something like that, where it, it's it's sort of above and beyond what would ever be needed to secure that product. GSA then becomes, or whoever the, the buying agency becomes responsible for the disposal of that waste. Uh, so that's an additional cost that was never really requested by the consumer that has now been imposed on the consumer once the, the item is shipped. Um, and it, at some point during you know, the acquisition, we are paying for, for that. We're paying for the disposal, but then we're also paying for that added cost of increasing the packaging potentially that is the, the item is sent in. Um, lastly, we're considering packaging because it resonates with people. Um, it's waste that's immediate. People can see it. Um, it it's it's uh, very tangible. Um, so the, the other uh, piece of this to consider too, before we go too far, is when we did the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, there was also feedback. Um, we received 65,000 comments uh, from, from the public um, regarding that. And, and some of the comments, uh, they were all, I would say, in favor of taking some sort of action, but there was feedback where um, I would say folks gave you know statements as to things they're observing in their everyday life regarding plastics, where it is something that is very tangible. Um, when we think through the, the problem, we're looking at it from a policy perspective as, you know, reduce, reuse, or recycle. Um, and and I, when I'm seeking advisement on this, this could be, we could be pursuing a combination of these things. We could be consuming, we could be um, focusing on one or, or, you know, two of the three. Um, but things to consider is um, redu reducing is, is beneficial because from what's been, what I've researched is that it would be the lowest cost, the lowest effort change um, if you don't consume it in the first place. Um, reuse would be um, potentially an initial cost to industry, but then, you know, the government can keep utilizing something over and over again. Um, and then recycling. Um, for plastics, recycling currently is is not particularly successful. Um, the highest rate of worldwide plastic that's been recycled is at 9%. It kind of seems to fluctuate between five to 9% on any given year, uh, depending on, on, you know, different factors within that, that year. Um, so as mentioned, the steps we've already taken are, we had a petition, we approved in part, denied in part. Uh, we published our advanced notice of proposed rulemaking 
Um, as I mentioned, there were 65,000 comments regarding this space. Um, all of them were really to, to take some sort of action. Um, and it, it could be different it, because there was different points of view that were submitted. Um, we had major industry, we had congressional responses. Um, the congressional responses uh, were, um, we've had uh, Democrats in, in, and independent and uh, Republican responses. Uh, we have also received um, different organizational groups that, as I mentioned, that this topic really spoke to them. Um, for example, uh, there was um, a lot of people in the uh, southeastern part of the United States that responded, uh, some of which submitted pictures of things they've observed on coastlines regarding just plastic waste pollution. Um, and, and then the, the step that we're also taking is today seeking uh, your advisement as to how to proceed. Um, so again, going through the, uh, it, the ANR, uh, ANPR responses, as I mentioned, um, over, overall positive. Um, there really wasn't uh, anyone who said do nothing. <laughs> and um, the one thing that I would say was, was definitely something that, you know, there was different, which is I think where this, the advisement comes in is um, also, you know, to consider not to conflate materials, um, you know, don't with the, basically the material with the material property, the compostability, the durability, um, and then the packaging system and design. Uh, basically, one of the things that they wanted us to focus on overall was to change not just the thoughts towards the risk of that product, but also what the social and environmental impacts are of the product. Um, and ag again, it, it, was, it was very interesting to see sort of a wide range of responses to, um, to this question, um, including from, uh, from industry partners, it was also from small businesses as well. Um, and overall, I would say that in terms of the, the statements that were made, the recommendations really focused it on, on it in solicitation um, for, for federal acquisition versus, or at least what was being described versus it being like in a post-award um, situation. Um, let's see here. Oh, um, so and then again, just to kind of address a few things that I thought were interesting in the responses we received just for, I guess, um, some brainstorming thoughts. Um, different companies highlighted the use of packaging and branding. Uh, that could be in different contexts as well. That could be either a company that is using disposable packaging um, for part of, of what they're trying to meet within the, the market. Um, but it also could be companies that are using reusable because that could be part of what they're messaging to their consumer is that uh, that's the environmental step that they've taken as a company. Um, there was some responses regarding the stability of products themselves. Um, in the cases of cleaning or cosmetic products, there might be a rationale as to why the, pro why the packaging could not be changed from a material other than plastic. Uh, and then also they highlighted the, um, basically the reuse of, of packaging can be helpful with different products, regardless of if that packaging is made out of, um, say, glass or even plastic, because it's helpful with the uncertainties in the current supply chain. Um, so if you keep reusing it, then you know that you, you always have access to your packaging. Um, in terms of comments from the plastics and resin industry, overall the responses asked for more recycling. Um, and they also asked about where the plastic is coming from. Um, they, we, we asked those questions, we did not receive feedback. Um, for the congressional responses, I've highlighted in these slides will follow this meeting. Um, I hyperlinked different, these are different letters that we received from different um, congressional members um, in terms of things to address. I would say in terms of the responses, um, with the exception of the multiple congressional member letter, which was essentially an encouragement letter, uh, the ones from Senator Carper's office, Representative Griffith and Representative Pence's office, um, were really more just things to look out for prior to any um, rulemaking or, or policy change being adopted. Um, and, and just so that we are aware of, of different, um, I guess, factors that, that could come in into limiting or, or recommending to our industry partners any changes in their packaging. 
Um, I also just wanted to highlight for, for uh, your subcommittee that there are other government plastic policies that are currently in play. Um, basically, in terms of where we, we have seen successful implementation, uh, New Zealand um, has adopted plastic reductions as has Australia, Scotland, uh, for the United States, California and Maine have both different levels of single use plastics. Um, all these are really reduction um, policies. No, none are truly banning the material. And recently, since I made these slides, I saw Canada has also uh, issued a reduction policy for their government's consumption. Um, the challenges that we're identifying is really asking industry partners to update their commercial practices and then clearly stating what the, the objective is not to ban plastic, but rather the reduction of waste. Um, educating both industry partners and government as to how to address increased plastic waste and then also um, increased communication with industry to keep the conversation going. And we do want to go a bit beyond already existing regulations that could attach to plastics, for example, USDA's BioPreferred program. Um, that really addresses, uh, say, like plastic utensils or um, food containers in government cafeterias would fall underneath the BioPreferred program. Um, but we want to go a little bit further than that in terms of what the what we're we're seeking, the solution we're seeking. Um, so that I'm going to exit out of full screen. So. It if Mark is available, uh, Mark had submitted a question to me that hasn't come through to everybody yet, but Mark, why don't you get us started? Thank you for that, Steve. The, the question I have, Adina, is what is Europe's best practices for plastics? Uh, not using them seems to be the best solution since it's not recycled over 9%. And I also want to comment that I recently came back from a couple of islands in Hawaii and it was heartbreaking because beyond glass, they recycle nothing. All metal and, and all uh, other plastic items are thrown away as garbage. China refuses to take any of it now, so they don't even bother. Okay. Um, so the first question about what we've seen with uh, European policy. It depends on the the country that we're, we're considering looking at. Um, I would say the one that really I was so surprisingly, I would be um, New Zealand government, which is not European, but they probably had the most information in terms of, I would say, how they're addressing it and what the impacts were and the economic impact, which is really what I also want to, to view. What they're doing within European countries is variable um, in terms of overall, I would say reduction. There's also a lot of sorting uh, but it depends on what country you're modeling after. So, for example, within the EU, there's a lot of examples and information I could find on Scandinavian countries. So, um, Sweden and Norway had where they're taking, you know, their waste and dividing up um, what type of waste it is, and then truly trying to recycle it. The other piece of it as well is that those countries highlighted um, a circularity that we really are not seeing in our country. For example, in Sweden and I forget the terminology for it off the top of my head, but it's a program where basically it's, they've always had it where you can bring your plastic bottles back to a grocery store, but get money immediately once you return them. So it's sort of, I would say, instant recycling in, in terms of what you can, um, you can get where there is a financial incentive on the part of the consumer. And, and then that plastic goes directly back to uh, the manufacturer to, to receive it. Um, Overall, with the ANPR responses, that was something that was, I would say, consistent with um, companies that were engaged in actual plastic production is the concern about not getting their product back once it enters the marketplace. Um, so if you had a system that was, I would say, more structured like that, that's, that's sort of Sweden has really addressed that where you don't have waste escaping into the environment. But in our current system, especially where we're looking at recycling centers being at the municipal level, um, I think it was last week there was a, an article I, that I saw come up about, you know, there was somebody doing kind of like a, a review of where waste was going out of a California recycling plant um, for plastics. 
And, and to that point, there's a lot of things where these materials are just getting lost in our environment. They're not actually making it back into any type of circular economy. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the things that we're, we're kind of seeking to address where, you know, there's the first piece of it, which is a lot of the plastic policy. So if we look at California's plastic policy and theirs just went into effect um, where they where they are addressing packaging as of this summer, they've um, basically expanded what they initially started with. But their initial start was addressing straws and plastic bags. And now they've expanded into, you know, other single use plastics such as containers. So in terms of reduce, so it seems like a lot of these policies are going towards reductions versus any other type of modification within the supply chain. Um, at least for, from what I've been able to research where others have gone. Um, and it's the same thing with uh, Canada's policy really talks about redundant packaging to reduce that. Well, I, I, was, just, I, I was just poking my, my colleagues in the chat, hoping we can spur some conversations. Ah, oh, good. Uh, Mark has another one and then I have a couple coming. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, thank you, Adina. What we've looked at is corrections industries in New Mexico to see if we can utilize that workforce. It's a lot of jobs that teenagers and others don't want to take. But in regard to recycling, we used to offshore a lot of this to other countries that no longer take it. Can we use correction industries, which is under the corrections umbrella, as a potential solution in the U.S. where they can earn money for sorting and helping recycle materials? Uh, that other countries no longer accept? Well, there's a few pieces to that. On the one hand, when it we, we do have, um, for procurement, we do look at, we do business with the um, uh, federal prison industry. Um, so there is, I, I guess, like there is something where it does touch on federal acquisition. But in terms of like implementing an overall program like that, that wouldn't be, at least within my agency's scope. Um, for GSA. But I, I think it's, I mean, it, it sounds like a, a reasonable approach is just really, you know, what's within the General Services Administration's ability to, to address change. Um, our biggest, I guess, space for change is, so aside from being, we're always referred to as the federal government's landlord because of the um, public building services, but then we also maintain large acquisition vehicles for other agencies to procure from. So there's like the federal supply schedules um, along with other government wide uh, acquisition contracts. So it'd really be kind of something that would either address, you know, probably I would say within the procurement vehicles is, is really where the scope of this could be utilized. Um, so, so many things I like about that answer, and it begs two two questions, but we're going to go in different directions and, and realize that I'm, I'm not pressuring you. I'm just speaking out loud to the group here. Uh, one of the last things you said reminds us that we were convened by GSA. And remember, the, to some extent, we're speaking to Jeff Kozis and his community here, but GSA is the Center for Federal Procurement Acquisition Policy, but isn't, doesn't have power. They're not OFPP and others. So I think that's one, but let me ask two related questions on the on the mandate. And I, I'm not necessarily expecting an answer on either, but hear me out. Uh, my gut reaction when I hear single use packaging is I immediately started thinking about the Postal Service. And if we've learned anything from the fleet procurement in the last two years, which is we've been reminded that the Postal Service is not part of the federal acquisition community in terms of executive agencies. GSA has no power over them. And I realize fleet is outside of your mandate, but I am kind of curious whether the Postal Service is playing as part of this conversation or we don't, we don't even speak to them at all. So that's my easy question. My harder one, I, I, I again, I grew up picking up bottles off the side of the road to make money for entertainment on the weekends. I mean, this was pretty lucrative stuff when we were kids, bottles and cans. I mean, that was Saturday night entertainment. You know, it, it was wonderful. And I have spent a fair amount of time in some of the states, fewer and fewer, that actually do have rebate problems. But this, again, is another great example where probably beyond this committee, 
But in terms of the large systemic thinking we, I think we want to be thinking about is historically recycling has been a state and local problem. Well, let's go back to Mark's point. We're experiencing market failure. The federal government could at every post office in the country or at other places set up rebate programs. Bring me your bottles or your cans or whatever. And in all of the states, and there's a lot of them, uh, you know, as someone who travels a lot, there's a lot of states that have garbage recycling programs. But the government could easily fill that void um, if they wanted to take proactive steps. Now, of course, it's an appropriations problem. It's a management problem. Someone's got to have the mandate. But I do think one of the things we should be having the conversation about as the committee is, are we willing to accept the constraints that the answer to 90% of the problems is, oh, we can't do that. Anyway, any thoughts? Um, so the first piece of it, so so basically I wrote up all my findings on the different comments that were received and that kind of brings us up to where we are now. Um, so I have not reached out to the post office to ask them any um, questions about their participation. Uh, that being said, one of the, I think, very real world examples during this whole process that um, I know others have related to regarding uh, packaging within a federal program is when um, uh, the, the federal government was uh, uh, providing free COVID testing kits for, for if you, you know, submit your request and it went to the post office and then the, they delivered the kit. Well, the kit is all plastic and it's in a box and it's already kind of protected and then outside of that they were you know wrapping with like maybe three inches of bubble wrap around the box and then that gets sent to the consumer um that's sort of the type of excess that at least in my thinking really is something that we could try to 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 reduce because it's sort of like again i wanted the plastic item that was sent to me which is the test kit but i didn't need all the other waste that's now on me to try to throw away and, and make sure that it goes to where it needs to go um and i, I agree with I, I think one of the things that would be interesting within this committee um although i'm, I'm you know, i know i'd have to defer to, to boris and stephanie about the rules of the committee is it would be interesting to kind of see you know for advisement if there are opportunities where there could be you know advice provided to, to GSA, like, well, GSA, you have authority where you could do this, but then maybe say, but, you know, the next step after you do this is then see if you can get OFPP to support you in this and kind of go down the line of different supports. Um, you know, Department of Defense is another one where GSA, uh, that's the other part I, I guess I didn't bring up in my, my spiel is we also support DOD quite a bit. That's actually part of the history of our agency is that We've always been a supportive avenue for, for defense. So um, that's another piece of this. Like maybe then we get DOD to participate. So the, I would say that for the advisement, it could be a stepped approach um, that could also be really helpful, uh, not just to you know my role in my agency, but then to the rest of the uh, government agencies. And, and I apologize, are you seeing the chat? Because we've had a number of questions in there. So oh. if it's okay with you, uh, I'm gonna let you read because I see at least two, maybe three, and I think there's one more coming. Okay, it's very tiny. Hang yeah, on. I wanna, if you don't mind, I wanna say Leslie had a comment. Um, Leslie, uh, would you mind uh, presenting your comment to Adina? Sure, and I apologize, I'm having um, connection issues, which is why I keep going off camera, but I was just curious, you know, we hear so much with recycling that there's not a market for products that are recycled and the federal government could really be driving that in a big way. I went to the post office recently, bought boxes, didn't see anything that said they were recycled content. Maybe they were, I don't know. So I'm just wondering if we're also looking at the requirements for recycled content so that we're driving that market a little bit more ambitiously. Um, well, there's a few pieces to that. So with regarding um, the, so my focus for this rule has just been on the recycle, the recyclability of plastic and really learning about plastic. Um, overall, I would say that it seems that within the United States for plastic to be recyclable, it should have the, the Mobius symbol, the chasing arrows, 
on the bottom of whatever the item is, um, that's a one or a two level. If it's higher than that, there's a high chance that the municipality has no ability to recycle, even though that scale goes from a one to a seven. So now we're talking numbers three through seven. <laughs> there's, there's, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's weird because it's basically indicating it makes the consumer think that it's a recyclable item, but in fact, it, it isn't. Um, and I'm not really certain where that the 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 Mobius scale that's that's a piece of my research I, I need to I admittedly need to research into more um, as to you know what the intent is really because I would say that's a little bit misleading in some ways I think it's better than not to have a, a Mobius symbol if you're not recyclable at all because that's that's an issue with you know where the consumer is um, in terms of recyclability though looking at at nationwide scale uh, I did reach out to within GSA our point of contact who really um, tracks like all the waste management within our bill, our um, buildings, who works in um, public building service. And she couldn't give me statistics on actual recycled materials from each one. And the reason for that is because it's variable depending on what municip municipality you're in. Um, so GSA, I, I know that it doesn't necessarily apply across the board to every federal agency, but we are one of those federal agencies that does seem to have a presence in, in most major cities because of the federal courthouses and um, other federal properties that we own. Uh, and so we are, we do have kind of, I would say like um, a finger on the pulse across the country as to, you know, what, what it looks like in different cities. Um, but that was something that was very, that spoke to me as well with this project is, we could see if we reduce the packaging, we could track a reduction in waste, but we wouldn't necessarily be able to track a reduction in what's being recycled or what's not being recycled because it, it, it's different between, you know, which state you're in or which city that state is in, depending on what the program is. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting and helpful. I guess I'm asking a, maybe a little bit different question in that is, is the federal government setting minimum uh, recycle um, content requirements so that all plastic wrap would have, I don't even know if this is technically possible, would have to have a 20% minimum recycled content or all cardboard used in packaging or, um, you know, um, that kind of thing. So they really driving it from the buyer's end driving a demand for recycled products, which in turn would probably help compliance at your end. Um, so there is, within the federal acquisition regulations, there is uh, information on recycled content. Um, so for off the top of my head, I know, for example, paper is one um, where I want to say the percentage is that it should have at minimum a 30% recycled content element. And then um, the government is is told like by the recycled paper, uh, th there isn't one for plastic. So, so we do have some regulation for when we consume something as to recycled content, okay. um, but we don't yeah, have it. And then, yeah, and then to the circularity of it, once we get, the, the FAR really speaks to getting that recycled content. It doesn't necessarily say like, and once you use that copier paper that had the recycled content, I want you to put it in a recycling bin. It doesn't go that far. It kind of stops mid cycle. And, and with with apologies, I'm going to exercise the chair's prerogative because Boris and Stephanie are pinging us on the clock. So, Adina, first, thank you so much for joining us. Second, to the extent that apparently under the agenda rules, we're about to jettison you, nothing personal. <laughs> how, can, how can we be of greatest value to you? If, for example, if you'd like, you could drop your email or your contact into the chat and folks could individually respond to you. Uh, the one thing I can't do, because I don't speak for the, the committee or the subcommittee, is necessarily suggest that we're going to embrace this as an agenda item in any meaningful way. But again, I really want to thank you so much. I find it fascinating. Uh, I hope you'll be open to input from us individually and collectively. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I put my email in the chat and um, I look forward, I hope I hear from, from you all soon. I know um, many of you I recognize from other committees because I also do the bike clean as well. <laughs> so, um, but again, if you have any ideas for me and it would maybe not, 
I'm specifically looking for GSA, but if you do have something that you would like to potentially pass on to another agency where it's within their, their scope, um, let me know and I can always reach out to somebody as well. Thank you, Adina. Uh, just want to reiterate, we really appreciate you making yourself available on extremely short notice. So it was a great presentation and certainly a, a fascinating case study for us in, in you know, what it means to, to, to undertake you know, rulemaking change uh, and something we need to keep in mind. Uh, I think we are going to transition uh, momentarily to uh, a discussion of the mission of this subcommittee. Um, Boris, I'm, I'm not sure if we can pull something up here. We've got a draft that uh, we made available. Uh, and, and this is actually a good moment to remind you all. Uh, so I'll be the first to admit that I have struggled periodically getting into the shared folder. I hate to be ageist in, in describing my limitations to be more than one electronic avatar, but we do now have a shared folder and there is a broad committee folder, and then we have a subcommittee folder. Uh, there is a draft mission statement in there now, and hopefully Boris or Stephanie are going to make that appear on the screen momentarily. But in addition, we've posted some other things there as well. We encourage you to add things in the uh, folder we've created, or if you think we should create other folders, by all means, please do so. Yes, Steve, I, I, I am on the shared drive, so I'm going to go ahead and find them. You want the mission statement first, and I'll go ahead and find that. Can Please. you hear me? Okay. Please. That yep. would be great. Yep, yep. So, you know, I, I'll say, uh, you know, I, I tried to undertake uh, putting a draft together for consideration for the committee, uh, you know, trying to think about how we might communicate our purpose, uh, you know, how we might, you know, achieve goals. Uh, this isn't my forte. And in fact, when I submitted it to the professor, he gave me a C minus. Uh, so uh, there is no uh, pride of authorship here. It's really just a couple of words for you guys to consider. I think that we, we tried to rope in some of the concepts. Uh, can you see my high. screen? Yep, we can see it, Boris. Perfect. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just read it aloud and then I'd like to hear kind of some feedback from uh, the rest of the group. Uh, the mission of the policy and practice subcommittee is to identify, develop, and recommend the most impactful changes to federal acquisition regulations, policies, and practices to support robust climate and sustainability action. Uh, now, you know, where there's a lot of recurring themes we've heard over the course of the day so far here, uh, transparency, data, technology, small business, communities, I mean, mandate. There's a lot of things that we could incorporate, a lot of words, a lot of key terms. Uh, happy to hear, you know, hopefully some folks who are, are better at crafting these types of statements uh, and get some feedback and maybe some concepts we can rope in. And the only other thing I'd add, just having sat in with one of the other subcommittees when they began this, um, again, the one thing that we don't want to do is agree on a mission statement that you feel doesn't address the reason that you're here. So the goal is to be more inclusive rather than necessarily, I hate to say, the goal is not to be elegant um, at the cost of being inclusive. So uh, I don't think we're gonna resolve this today, but I do think that uh, everyone should feel free to add information in there, but I think it's worth spending a few minutes today just to hear from all of you as to what you think we should be saying about who and what we are. Hey, Steve, uh, let me let me jump in here. So DFO coming in, uh, based on our conversations in the previous two subcommittees, can you hear me? I'm having some connectivity issues. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind as you're, as you're putting this together is the, the lens of GSA from the point of view that the recommendations that will come out from these, um, advisory committee, the, the gap pack, would be things that are actionable, things that GSA could actually implement. So what I'm saying that just to keep that in mind, uh, um, not necessarily to, to influence how you come up with the emission statement, but just we, we had that conversation with the other two subcommittees and, and I actually had a conversation with Jeff earlier this morning, just in that, that same point. Uh, so just keep in mind, we want actionable recommend. I wanted to go nope. out there. 
noted actionable, I think is, is the word that's going to drive us. Uh, I think Leslie put her hand up. Boris, thank you for saying exactly what I was going to say. And I was going to suggest that we recommend the most impactful and actionable changes, because if we just look at impactful, there may be a million things that never could make it to the um, to the policy level. But if we add actionable, we may be able to winnow out some that that wide terrific in principle um, just can't be done um, under the auspices of this committee. So I would just add that word. I realize you probably don't want to get into wordsmithing because that starts us down a rabbit hole. But, but, but I do think we do need yeah, to go right. down that route. And I think that's helpful. And similarly, so if you haven't seen David's comment, uh, I'm constantly intrigued by the nomenclature and vocabulary issues around climate change and sustainability. And just a very, very brief riff on this, which I'm sure most of you are fully versed in. What I find outside the United States is the starting point, the touchstone, the Rosetta Stone on sustainability are the UN SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. What I have found in the United States and federal procurement is because we so frequently describe things like small business, labor, and environmental as collateral policies, that sustainability today is frequently focused more on adapting to and mitigating climate change. Uh, I think that we do want to be inclusive. And to the extent we've already talked about environmental justice, I think we should use broader sustainability where we can. But my personal preference would be to have climate change explicitly out there at the forefront. But again, my personal opinion. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly Wise, White. Thanks. And so maybe like to your point just now, Stephen, and to something that Boris and actually Adina raised earlier about kind of these actionable things. Like, so, you know, Adina mentioned, like, are we going to be focused on what is in the GSA's purview specifically? or what other federal agencies can also do. So I think we need to think about that as we're looking at the mission of action items, like this is what from a macro level actually GSA can do. And then this is how we could maybe offer recommendations for some of the other federal agencies that might be working with them. I think the other thing that you know you highlighted, Stephen, is that that difference between climate and sustainability sometimes and making sure that we're not working at cross purposes, that we're really looking at this holistically and that we're looking at this from kind of a unified approach that we're not offsetting one for the other and that we're really being thoughtful about what these actions are and if they're realistically going to be impactful both for climate and sustainability and you know you make a really good point about you know the definition of sustainability and that's let's not forget that OSTP is actually looking at a definition for sustainable chemistry right and so we need to be thoughtful about does that have any role here and what we might be recommending moving forward because we don't want to inadvertently like I said be at cross purposes with you know focusing in on some of these things but now we're limiting what our ability is. And then I guess the final thing I maybe wanna come back to, and it's not really built in here, but it might be something that we need to think about as a secondary to this mission is, you know, Adina focused in on the fact that a lot of this effort so far has been focused on reducing the use. She focused on plastics, obviously, but, but not really so much on recycling or reusing. And so I think we need to be thoughtful that we're addressing where there is a lack or you know, a disconnect to increasing recyclability or reuse of products. And so to not lose sight of that and just looking at ways to kind of reduce our use. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Amlan? Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to echo what Kimberly just said, because there are other agencies that are agencies that are working on similar uh, efforts, as well as states that are already, uh, they already have procurement policies in place a lot around bike clean, quite a few, um, five or six states at this point, uh, and a few more uh, considering it in legislation. So I, I think generally speaking, having a common approach, or at least an approach that, or at least approaches that are not uh, confusing in their multiplicity would be very, very useful and to continue to work with other agencies is very crucial. That's number one. And numbers, uh, the number two is 
when I'm looking at this language, impactful and actionable, and again, without getting into wordsmithing, I think in, at, at some point we need to introduce the idea of measurably impactful and actionable, because there are a lot of practices that we think of as a good idea, and they are a good idea in certain contexts, and they're not in other contexts. So recycling, for example, especially with construction materials, sometimes they work very well. Other places, we have to worry about performance, and we have to think, we have to like balance the way we use recycled materials. So I think having that constant, the idea of uh, being able to measure the impact that is happening in, uh, or at least assess how effective our, our policies are, is going to be uh, is is going to be very important. Um, and the third uh, point that I've been picking up is this idea of like focusing on climate change, which is extremely important as you know as as this the conversation, the context within this conversation. Um, but there is also resilience, and I think it's uh, this was stated a few times. I think. Climate change and resilience sometimes when it comes to a practical implementation based policy, they may not always provide us a happy uh, intersection. So what is resilient, uh, what, what is a resilient solution may not always be a solution that helps us decarbonize, for example. So we have to be um, a little bit um, cognizant of that and, um, and find maybe start with like, or at some point of time have at least within the committees and subcommittees, exact definitions of what we need, mean by sustainability. If we are using resilience, which, which you know, again, we, we've been talking about adaptation, and when I hear adaptation, I think resilience. But you know, so how how we use those words, uh, at least internally, if you have a common uh, definition understanding, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mark. You had your hand up. Thank you. I'd like to echo a little bit of what uh, Aman had said about measurement and, and consider at the end of the first uh, sentence of the, of the mission, rather than leave it at action, maybe replace it with measurable, sustainable results. I like that. I think we're not going to get away from having data-driven results, uh, measurable uh, success at the end of this. Uh, Antonio. You're on All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. So I thought I thought one other point that uh, I believe Nigel actually brought it up a little bit earlier, uh, in that you know we're not only looking at driving a policy that helps us have you know the the environmental impacts that we desire, but because this is really the next forefront of where we're going to be going from a uh, in, in death industry and uh, economic of, of uh, <clears throat> this whole program, I'm thinking. Somewhere on here, we should re also address that what we're trying to do should be done in a manner that grows or strengthens the U.S. industrial base, because this is a whole new economy that's going to be growing and developing. And we want to make sure that as it grows and develops, that all aspects of the uh, country's uh, capabilities are put to use, including uh, small businesses, the women minority businesses, and those in rural communities. Uh, so that it's it's very sustainable from an economic perspective as well as an environmental uh, perspective and gives us a, a potential leg up uh, against other countries who may not have such a similar approach. And, and Antonio, may, may I just, if we could kind of keep in the back of our mind, one of the, and I, I mentioned the longer comment that I dropped into the chat earlier about what I heard from the small business community on Tuesday. But mm -hmm. one of the things that I think is, is unfortunately not talked about enough is when we when we encourage people to start thinking in terms of scope one, two, and three emissions, all of a sudden the supply chain and the transportation routes become much more telling. And what Europe often refers to as the, the slow food movement or local food movement or whatever, um, you know, I think one of the most potent opportunities for small businesses is to market that again it may be cheaper to buy from someone far away but my actual emissions in bringing this to you locally right. Right. again as someone who grew up in the military we used to get all of our <clears throat> services locally from the small businesses until we right. get into the big base ops contract so i think that's another example where we need to think more creatively 
about how we're describing what our requirements are and what we value. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic point. And adding to it is not only the fact that you can, in all likelihood, have a, a similar return or better return from buying local than the, the impact that happens from the from an environmental, the negative impact that happens from environmental transporting goods from such a distance. But there is an economic impact that when you're buying from local is going to have a value uh, add-on uh, to the local economy in a way that would be bypassed if you're, you know, you're just buying things from, you know, some faraway distant place, and including places that are not even in the United States. Thank you. Uh, I see Nigel, you have your hand up, and I think yeah, if I, if uh, I could, Nigel, you could take us home. Sorry, if I could piggyback on that, the the there is precedent for doing that. Um, post Hurricane Katrina, we used the Stafford Act to require local buy, and what that did, and it it's a didn't matter what you did, whatever you're doing, if you do it local, you will get extra points in your contract, um, because simple things like debris removal, we were able to get money into the hands of local people that didn't have anything else. And that churned dollars into the local economy. So there are ways, and there's already precedent set for doing that um, and, and, and leveraging the legislation that's already in place in order to have small businesses and local businesses participate in the federal procurement process. So that there are things that we could leverage uh, and just with minor tweaks there. Steve Porras, we're we're into our next uh, agenda item here. Should we continue uh, on this and and perhaps uh, if, peel? Off? If, well, yeah, well, I think with Boris's indulgence, I'd actually love to at least hear from uh, Anish, Amlin, and Kimberly before we transition to the next thing. And I guess you know, channeling Boris, if if we could keep these comments relatively quickly so we can move on to the next thing. But I'd love to hear from each of you. Great. Sure. Thanks. So one thing that feels like it's missing to me is a level, a statement about our level of ambition. Uh, when we say something like support robust climate and sustainability action, it can come across as a little bit vague. I know that we may not necessarily want to put that out there, but so I, I have three ideas for different flavors of ambition that we could write into this mission statement. One is, do we want to say something like aligning with best practices? Another type of statement would be positions the federal government as a leader in climate and sustainability. Um, and then a third one, which I think aligns with what's sort of already been said is um, the level of ambition will align with triple bottom line principles. So economic, social, and environmental benefits. So those are just three flavors of how we can add like a, just something about how we're thinking about climate and sustainability action, what the level of ambition is. Great, thank you. Uh, Amlan? Yeah, I'm just gonna to quickly touch on what Antonio was saying, and especially about the food. This again brings up a very important question on trade-offs because if you look at life cycle assessments, if you're just focusing on decarbonization, life cycle assessment of food systems, um, distances traveled actually don't create such a huge uh, impact. They're actually a relatively smaller impact. It's the production and growth of food that has a much bigger impact. It's like order of 83% versus 11%. Now that's still an important impact, but I think that's where if you focus on sustainability, suddenly looking at, and as personally being a big supporter of local food movement, as a, from a sustainability perspective, and as Anish said, if you bring in the triple bottom line, suddenly now you have a slightly different solution because you're looking at a local supply chain, you're looking at local economies, as well as looking at uh, the environmental impact and tying all those three together. So again, this is kind of important to, you know, going back to the definitions and how we're looking at what we're prioritizing is, becomes important. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Kimberly Wise-White. And I'll just end, I just wanted to come back to something that Nigel said about the buy local, right, is that I think as we're thinking about what we might be doing here, that we have to make sure, one, that we think about scalability of the actions that we're thinking about putting in place, right, because some of these things might be very large and it may take time for them to scale up. Um, over the long term. So I think we need to be thoughtful about that. And two, just coming back to Nigel's point about 
the lo by local is that we need to be sure that that's not a short term solution that we're really building in the infrastructure that will continue to allow those local businesses to be engaged for the long term and not just for a small finite period of time. And on Kimberly's point, um, I, I really want to go back to the comment that I dropped into the chat because I am, I hear Jeff Kozis's voice in my head, as I'm sure Boris and Stephanie did as well, basically saying, uh, we will not have succeeded if all we do is shoot for the moon. So I think what they would love to get out of us, and, I, and I'm not saying they're exploiting us, but I think what they really want us to do is empower them with some things they can do quickly to win. So, you know, scalability, we have bite-sized things and then there's the, the big buffet. So I think that one of the challenging things for us is to be thinking at multiple tracks at once. So small and large without necessarily excluding either one. So I think that's gonna be really important. Yeah, you, you raised some really good points there, Steve. I, I think you're, you're spot on. Um, I'll, I'll encourage, I mean, this is your call, but folks have access to this document. They can drop down some ideas here. But definitely, I think that would be a great uh, homework for the group to really think about this mission statement. I heard a lot of great ideas. I started capturing a few things, but it was going to be way too much for this, this scope of year. Uh, but I think uh, you all have access to these documents. So I'll encourage you all, you know, with Steve's and, and Luke's gu guidance to, to drop your ideas there. Great. Thank you. I think that's a great idea, Boris. Uh, Steve, I guess you want to take a few minutes. We probably only have a few minutes to tee up the uh, issue prioritization and strategy and challenges and guests and potential speakers. Sure. Right. So if you if you drop into the into the shared drive, and I think Boris is doing this for us now, but there's a couple of other things that you see in there. And one of them is the issue of what we should focus on. And another talks about what we should be thinking of in terms of future speakers. And you can open both of those. I think that from an agenda standpoint, what Luke and I were hoping is that in a moment, Boris or Stephanie is going to share the original list that you've seen before of the suggested priorities. And so we can talk about that a little bit, but. What we don't want you to do is forget about the other issue of proposed speakers. Now, when you open the document on proposed speakers later, and again, we're more than willing to hear suggestions now, keep in mind that what we did is we showed you the template that another group began with. So the first few bullets that you'll see, this is from another group. And then if you'll scroll down a little bit more, Boris, uh, the policy specific recommendations, we've basically suggested a few approaches at this point. And again, this may be relevant to what we're doing in terms of policy priorities as well. But one of the suggestions that I was making is to the extent that we now have a rule from the FAR Council out and it focuses on assessment, disclosure, and targeting, I think it would be very, very valuable for us to hear from some experts on what it means when we talk about scope one, two, and three. And frankly, I'd actually love to bring in the SBTI folks, the Science-Based Targets Initiative people, because currently they are seen as one of the stronger global independent verifiers. Another is, again, in the chat and in our in our discussions, you've heard from a few of us, the importance of how life cycle cost analysis is going to help us overcome the tyranny of low price. I expect there are numerous people who we could bring in. I suggested one colleague of mine who could talk on that, but I'd love to hear from others as well on that. One that I just mentioned to Luke yesterday, because I literally just found out about this one in an international conference yesterday, but the Chancery Lane project is utterly fascinating. And what they've been doing is literally globally crowdsourcing the types of contractual terms and conditions they think are helpful for addressing climate change. And then the last one you'll see on there, and frankly, this one comes directly from GSA, 
one thing that they're encouraging us to think about is to let them present to us the draft request for proposals that they're using in, a re, in an ongoing activity and get some feedback from us on some of those things. So those are all things to consider, but uh, I'm gonna stop now. And uh, Boris, if we could go back to the, the topics. And again, I'm gonna turn it back over to Luke, but we wanna hear from you again today or in the shared drive or in any other way as to what you think we should be focusing on. Last point on this, with regard to the topics, we really want to be focusing on something quick and easy that we can do and something broader based. And I mean, I have a couple of ways that I could describe that, but let, let's hear from others first, please. Yeah, can you all see my screen okay? Yes. All right. Looking for thoughts from the group. I see Stacy. Stacy, go for it. Yeah, so I think this kind of goes both with the speaking list, but also the list of um, topics. Um, again, I said this in my intro, but I think learning from those that are implementing these types of policies already in various forms, whether it's private sector players that have procurement policies around some of these things already in place and what they're doing, um, because they are purchasers just like the federal government on the presenting side, but also somewhere on here talking about um, let learning and leveraging policies that exist to help inform what we do and re recommend uh, as the outcome of this group. Because again, I don't think we have to create everything from scratch. We definitely don't want to recreate things that we don't need to. Um, so I don't know where that lives on here, but it's definitely something that I hope we're going to do is just really, you know, crowdsource what's already been done that's been done well uh, and leverage that versus, you know, try to create our own, our own answers to everything. Kimberly? And I would agree with that, Stacy. There is a lot of tools that exist that we can probably leverage and modify and improve upon, right? Versus recreating a wheel. One question I guess I had from this group too is number 10 talks about actually develop policy. And so I'm just wondering like, will this group have the time and ability to actually develop a policy to look at assessment criteria or should we be more focused on what some of those criteria might be as a recommendation i'm just cautious about whether or not we'll have the bandwidth to actually develop some policies positions very specifically for gsa to consider yeah uh, kimberly if i can take a shot of that i, I feel like the what you're looking at is providing advice and to, to the development of such policy, but not just, hey, develop a policy, but really give some meaty structure that we're really gonna develop a policy. I think Jeff spoke about that, you know, this is what it needs to address. So to, to answer your question, you, you will not be developing the policy, but you will be providing a well-informed, well-thought-out uh, structure that will help then do, those who actually develop the policy do that. If that makes sense, I don't know, Stephanie, if you wanted to add to that, because we had this conversation within our discussions no, I, with Jeff. No, I think it was very clear, um, Boris. Um, OK. So I know we are uh, up to our next session, which is a very important uh, public input. And we certainly didn't give this uh, enough thought or discussion. So we're certainly going to have to budget more time for it next time. Uh, and if there's, you know, anything between now and then that we want to add to this list, I think we can perhaps do that through a share document. Uh, Boris, is there a, a way to incorporate the public input now? Yeah, uh, we can. And uh, if you were done with this, I'll stop sharing my screen right now. Maybe we can come back to it. There's we'll go. Yeah. To make sure we'll we have start to sharing. And, and so... Yeah, and this at this point, uh, again, you and, and Steve can facilitate this as anyone who's not a member of the subcommittee that wanted to chime in uh, anything that you heard or whether it's a comment, not necessarily a Q&A because we will not engage in the Q&A, but this is an opportunity and you can just, uh, there's not that many folks here uh, who were not on the subcommittee. We have you know, a number of people that are in my team, but that's what we will do now. So, so you guys can facilitate that and just hope, hope make the invitation for anyone who wants to make a comment or could use the chat as well. Uh, are there any members of the public or other participants who want to uh, raise their hand or, or offer us a chat comment? 
Uh, this is Holly Elwood from EPA. I'm uh, standing in for Jenny Romer and i um, trying to turn my video on, but I don't, it's not coming on. At any rate, um, I would recommend one idea for speakers for the group might be to hear from some of the leads on uh, our net zero emissions procurement goal. And the, we have uh, sub goals under uh, the, our sustainability goals under executive order 14057 in the government that everybody's focused on right now. And so somebody like Jay Robel, who's working to help us meet our 100% EVs goal would be helpful to hear from because he could tell you, here's what we're doing now. And here's what we're finding as our challenges. And here's where we could use some, some help. You know, here's the, here's the sticky issues and the opportunities that we see to get uh, some more direction and recommendations that might be useful to to speed that along if the focus of this group is really going to be on climate. Um, you could do the same thing with the folks that are focused on carbon-free electricity and getting the leads for that um, to come and speak to this group. Um, and, and there are others uh, that I'd recommend for the other categories, but that might be one, one uh, set of speakers that would be really helpful. Thank you for that. Uh, any other public or non-committee member input? Okay, well, maybe we can go back to the, the list of priorities for a few minutes. Uh, unless we got a comment in here. And to the extent that all the hands are jumping up at once, uh, I, I, I just dropped into the chat box where Luke and I had made our first effort to capture as many of the 12 initial recommendations as possible and prioritize them and try to get a number of the issues. So uh, a brief summary of what we were thinking in terms of maybe a short term, maybe a longer term. But again, this is just to get the conversation going. Luke, um, I'm sorry, Luke, you do have a comment from uh, Chastity Hamilton. Uh, I cannot see it. If someone it's, else can, can I see I can it. read it for you. It says, if you are looking for a private sector um, advisement or speaker, Persona, Persephone has a world-class... Go ahead. Persephone, a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Persephone has a, a world-class uh, sustainability board, uh, including Paul uh, Dickinson and Curtis, uh, I know I'm going to mess this up, Re Revenel. Great. Thank you, Chastity, for that. Appreciate it. And we are going to capture the chat, so no, no worries. That's not going to go anywhere. Got a lot there. Terrific. And Holly sent, I think, a suggested uh, Jay Robel of DOE as a possible speaker uh, on challenges meeting 100% EV goal. I think that's great, too. Thank and, you. And, fr and frankly, I think one of the hardest things going forward is as our list gets longer, uh, how we prioritize them. So one of the things I encourage you to do if you go into the shared document later is if you look at, as you see the list, Perfectly okay to drop a little note in there. Um, you know, this is Leslie, and I think that's a great idea. This is Anish, I think this is a great idea. And the more of those that we see, that'll probably drive us in one direction or another. Okay, I think that closes out the public comments then. Are there any other comments or feedback or uh, on the policy and practice subcommittee topics? Anish, how are you? Go for it. So one thing that I'm not seeing on here, and it's kind of a little bit less exciting, but is policy cleanup, if you will. So when I think about procurement policies and what makes them difficult to achieve is there's some things that are redundant or some things that people are seeking exemptions from when they're applying for projects. So learning from GSA on what's working, what isn't working, and then also um, doing a filter to get rid of outdated procurement policies. So one that 
comes to mind from my experience in the building sector is uh, we used to have recycled and regional materials as key procurement requirements to, you know, move materials uh, producers in a certain direction, but now it's moving more towards just LCA being the protocol that you use. So there's things like that where there's like an itemized list that people were using previously and we can get rid of that itemized list and just use one performance indicator. So um, yeah, just like and, hygiene. And Anish, I, I think one important thing about what you say is, I think it's important to keep in mind and we have Holly with us, maybe she'll say more about this or maybe she can't, but it's important to keep in mind that there are multiple rules going through the FAR Council at the moment. So the one that is currently open for comment and getting all of the attention, and one of the ones that I think we should engage on, is the assessment, disclosure, and target rule. One of the things that I posted in the shared drive is a recent summary of all of the pending FAR cases, and I highlighted three. So I think that what some would say to you is, what you're talking about is the other rule that's coming. So my fantasy is that there's a big rule coming that's going to make a lot of dramatic changes that aren't all in FAR Part 23, because I think that's necessary. Of course, I don't have access to that rule yet, but I do think we want to be collecting all of the different things that are in the policy baselines and that are the practices that either need to be updated, fixed, corrected, or whatever. So I think it's a really important point. Yeah, and Steve, this is Holly. I mean, uh, there are three main cases that are in process under the FAR environmental case team. You mentioned FAR case 2021-015, and I put the link into the chat for folks. Um, we also have a case 2022-006 uh, uh, that's about streamlining the sections of the FAR related to sustainable procurement and aligning with the new directive from the administration from uh, the executive order 14057. That's in process of being developed now. And then there's a third that is also in process of being developed, which is the 2021-016 that's more on the social cost of carbon and um, considering um, ways that we might incorporate considerations of, of carbon in our procurements moving forward. So, yeah. Thank you, Holly. Uh, are there any other comments on this? I, I have a, a request for the group since we're getting the warnings from Boris and Stephanie, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, in our delusional fantasy, we're someday hoping that these meetings will be less than two hours, but we're, we're obviously starting out with plenty of cushion. But again, what would help us most is if we understand what you think would work going forward. So if anyone has any thoughts today, about other than trying to get a sequence of guest speakers in and what we should be by prioritizing on or how we should run the meetings differently, that would be really, really helpful. I, I see a hand from uh, Amlin. Amlin. Yeah, thank you. You know, I was just thinking about that because there are so many speakers that come to mind and it may be worth for us to uh, come up with a list of speakers, which, you know, there's, it's probably going to be somewhat long, but then to start clustering them up into potential panel discussions so that we can have the expertise, but really have the expertise in a more, uh, in a platform where we can afford some synthesis and, and not, again, not have them in isolation, but in context. So it may be useful to look at the uh, people who are getting signed up. For example, I, I put in a couple of names out there, and even though they're across two different uh, agencies, they're working on very similar stuff. And so having like maybe creating those clusters so that we can have all of them without having just a sequence of uh, decontextualized speakers. So creating context out of clusters may be useful. It's a great idea. Any other thoughts?
What about coordination with the other committees? I mean, they're, you know, they're going through a similar thought process, very similar ideas. They've had some terrific presenters and conversations over the last two days, things that, you know, this benef- this committee would benefit from hearing from too. Um, I know we can probably go and, and ultimately watch the, the broadcasts, but it is, you know, does it make sense for us to coordinate speakers with them and perhaps, you know, participate as observers in their groups or have them participate as observers here? Uh, I could see there being an opportunity for, you know, efficiency if we were, if there was some cross uh, collaboration uh, on, you know, very important kind of uh, broad presenters that will be applicable to all groups. Got a thumbs up from Amon. Thank you. <laughs> Any other feedback from uh, folks in this committee on things you saw in the other committee that we should be incorporating or And and let me just mention one thing, because I'm thinking about Boris and Stephanie now. Um, With regard to the good work the other committees are doing, as I understand the rules of engagement, they would rather us be watching those videos, because if too many of us go to those meetings, then they have a quorum problem. It's possible I just misunderstood that, but I think that if you aren't on one of the other committees, I think they're actually discouraging us from attending on a regular basis. Am I reading yeah. that right, Boris and Stephanie? Well, yeah, let me clarify. So first of all, one, one point to clarify here. So we are a subcommittee. So just the nomenclature, just to keep in that in mind. So we're subcommittee of the GAP fact, the, 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 the Fuller. Uh, you are absolutely welcome to join in the other meetings as observers, because as observers, you can definitely uh, watch what's going on. And then during the public comment, you can make some comments or you can definitely offer uh, your comments and you can see what's going on. So there is no problem whatsoever in terms of attending the other meetings. Uh, the, the subcommittees are already established and the numbers in the subcommittees do not create a problem with, with the quorum at all. So you, you are absolutely, there, there is no limitations there for you to observe any of the meetings. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, Troy and Cassius, they will do their best to attend all of the meetings. So they also serve as an integrator view and really connecting dots. And, and I think we're getting close to the end here. And I think Troy wants to, to make a couple of comments and, and welcomes and, and whatnot, but she can also address that as well. Yeah, but, but I did yeah. just want to go back, back so much. to that. So, yeah, go, go ahead, Troy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Boris, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Well, yeah, thanks. No, this is a a great segue to the remarks I was going to make because, um, as Boris said, um, my co-chair, Cassius Butts, and I do plan on uh, observing as many of the subcommittee meetings as we can, kind of under the ground rules that uh, Boris just laid out. Um, And we think that'll be so important for us to kind of help connect the dots between the the subcommittees and um, totally agree there'll be an interest with the subcommittees and knowing like who the speakers are going to be and um, the agendas for the other subcommittee members. So um, those are all really helpful suggestions. But I mean, first of all, I just want to um, thank uh, Steve and Luke for their leadership uh, on this subcommittee and, and pulling together the kickoff agenda for today. I thought this was just a terrific meeting to get this subcommittee launched. Um, I think uh, as I've sat through each of the subcommittee meetings this week, again, I, I'm just so uh, incredibly amazed by the talent that each and every committee member is bringing to the GAP SAC and um, so excited about uh, just the, the, the enthusiasm and energy that everyone is putting into their subcommittee roles. Um, so I think we're off to a great start this week. Uh, when I think about this, uh, committee in particular, I think the the range of topics that this subcommittee could take on, quite frankly, is pretty daunting. And um, agree with Steve that kind of as the list of potential items gets larger, (laughs) it's a challenge to prioritize. But I think your discussion today uh, is really setting you in in the right direction to try to do that so that, um, as you talked about with uh, the draft mission statement, just really arriving uh, to some recommendations that are impactful and actionable, uh, both some, some short-term easier ones and, and some uh, longer-term uh, broader suggestions. So again, um, appreciate so much the opportunity 
to observe today, and I look forward to all the future meetings. Yeah, thank you, and, and uh, thank you, Troy and, and Stephen. Look, and just one other word I wanted to put out there is for um, looking at ahead for the next couple of weeks. We are going to have a full committee meeting on January 12th. Uh, and so keeping in mind that the purpose of the January 12th meeting will be for each subcommittee to come to the full committee with proposed initiatives, uh, recommendations. I think, Steve, you had a spot on, like, you know, low hanging fruit things that could be, do, can be done in the short term versus longer term type initiatives. And it'd be a, so thinking about what that roadmap looks like between now and January 12th, so that you as a subcommittee will put four in front of the full committee. Here are the areas that we feel the subcommittee wants to take on and having done some coordination with the other subcommittees so that so there is some consistency and, and synergy with the rest of the group. So that, that was the other thought I wanted to make. Um, I think we're coming up to the hour. I don't know, Stephanie, if you had any other things in mind, anything else you wanted to say? No, just a wonderful conversation. I want to echo uh, uh, you and Troy, um, and I just look forward uh, to future uh, subcommittee meetings. Oh, but I do have one more comment. Uh, the other two subcommittees decided to do a recurring administrative meeting on the off weeks, um, basically the same day, but just for one hour. Uh, you all don't have to do that, but it's something for you to consider. If that's something you want to do, you can you can certainly do that, at, you know, put a placeholder and I would be glad to help you with that. Uh, but I just wanted to put that out there. You don't have to make a decision today. Something to, something to think about. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Steve. I have to say I'm ecstatic by the level of engagement and participation. And if that is any indicia of how we're going to play together in the future, I am guardedly optimistic. So again, thanks so much to Luke. Thanks so much to our GSA team. Uh, thanks so much to Chelsea, who's taking notes for us. And we should all send warm and fuzzies to Chelsea on a regular basis. But again, look forward to hearing from all of you again. Thanks so much. Agreed. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank so you. Meeting, meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.